I now have the pleasure of introducing you to a dear friend and fellow, fellow Aspen Institute board member, Katie Couric. <laughs> Katie is America's sweetheart. Why? It's very simple. Katie is so nice. <laughs> She's also the most successful and impactful female news anchor and journalist in America. From Arlington, Virginia, she rose to become the celebrated anchor of the Today Show, CBS News, and the coveted TV show 60 Minutes, among so many other glass ceiling breaking roles. She is the author most recently of Going There, her autobiography, a copy of which you will receive today. And she leverages her public persona to bring awareness to compelling causes in her only in Katie Couric way. Today she runs Katie Couric Media, with her fabulous NJB husband, John. That means nice Jewish boy. <laughs> and is the extraordinary mother of Ellie and Carrie. Please welcome Katie Couric. So I'm glad you're here. OK, let's go sit down. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh I feel like I should be interviewing Laura, not no. the other way around, because, I mean, it's incredible to hear about all your accomplishments. And we're conveling at this table. <laughs> Did I say it right? No. <laughs> OK, Katie, how did we meet? OK, so Katie was a friend of my mother-in-law's, Evelyn. And 15 years ago, we think? We were both at the Aspen Institute at a dinner, and I spied something on Katie's wrist. <laughs> we had the same watch. I thought, if we have that in common, we've got to have more in common. So I walked right over to Katie, and she, this gorgeous smile greeted me with such warmth. And that's how we met. That's right. Do you remember? Yes, I do. My watch was bigger than yours. <laughs> Um, oh. I heard this was a fun crowd, so I could be kind of loose. <laughs> Is that right? Hopefully that's true. OK, so the first question I have to ask, which is the question that you're all wondering, Katie, are you Jewish or Jewish? Well, I think George Santos has ruined Jewish. <laughs> so um, I would say today I'm Jewish. And Woo! yeah. And uh, you know, my mom was Jewish uh, growing up in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, it's something I write about in my book, which you'll all get a copy of. So please read it if you can. And uh, yeah, I was raised a Presbyterian. And my father was from Dublin, Georgia. His, my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, was a Sunday school teacher, a very sort of devout Christian. And I didn't find out I was Jewish until I was 10 years old and I was in Atlanta for my grandmother, my Nana, we called her Nana, her 70th birthday, which is pretty close right now for me. <laughs> and uh, I saw a menorah in my uncle's bookcase, my uncle Buddy. And I was like, wow, what does that mean? And I realized then and there that my mom's side of the family was in fact Jewish. You told Jody Cantor in an interview at the 92nd Street Y that you felt gypped. What did you mean by that? Well, I think I wish I had known more about my Jewish heritage. I've since learned a tremendous amount that my ancestors came over from Germany in the 1880s and settled in Alexander City, Alabama. So they were Southern Jews. And, um, you know, I, I, appreciate being raised a Presbyterian. I can't say I'm particularly religious, honestly. But culturally, I wish I had known more about uh, my Jewish heritage. And I think, you know, I've thought about it. I've talked to my Jewish relatives about it, my cousins who live in Birmingham. And I still have cousins in Alex City, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at the time, and I think we alluded to this, Phyllis alluded to it when she was giving you your award, Laura, that assimilation was kind of de rigueur for a lot of Jewish families. And growing up in Arlington, Virginia, 
I don't think there was a particularly vibrant Jewish community. And I think my mom was perhaps worried about anti-Semitism back then. I think she wondered if it would hurt my dad professionally. And so it was something that she sublimated and um, something that I wish she hadn't. Now, they, she grew up in Omaha, very reformed Jews. Uh, my, they had a Christmas tree. My grandfather apparently said, just pretend like it's somebody's birthday. <laughs> and so, uh, and uh, you know, she was confirmed. She wasn't bat mitzvahed. Um, but it's something, honestly, I feel so proud of and so appreciative of. And I feel very lucky to be a part of a community that has such important progressive values and cares deeply about philanthropy. And I'm just, I'm just really now, more than ever, very interested in learning about mm -hmm. my heritage and, and also about the plight of, of the Jewish people in general. And certainly, it's entered into my journalism through the years I covered the Unite the Right uh, rally in Charlottesville when I was doing a Nat Geo documentary on Confederate statues and iconography. And I witnessed at my alma mater at the University of Virginia those men carrying tiki torches saying Jews will not replace us. And so I'm very cognizant and, and very committed to covering stories that um, are important to the Jewish community. Speaking of Jewish philanthropy, you yourself have engaged a little bit in that. Can you tell us? Well, I think growing up, both my parents, I think, encouraged all their kids. There were four of us. My oldest sister, Emily, died of pancreatic cancer in early 2000 when she was 54. But they encouraged all of us to really be involved in philanthropy. We all worked at a camp for blind kids called the Columbia Lighthouse uh, summer day camp. It was at Mount Vernon Junior College, which no longer exists. But you know, when I remember being nine years old and having a carnival with my two friends, Diana Searleman and Janie McMullen, and raising $11.62 for the United Way. And um, you know, it was just something that was very much a part of our, our family. And since Laura's here, I, I'm curious, and I can't help myself turning the tables. But. <laughs> Tell me, how, tell me how you instilled sort of being philanthropical, philanthropical, philanthropic and, and, and giving back to your children, Laura. How, are you, how have you been able to do that? But clearly by example, but are there other things that you've done to make <clears throat> ensure that the legacy of the Lauder family continues? I'll give you this one. <laughs> We promised that I get to interview Katie, and I agreed to maybe one. Um, look, the, you know, I'm, my, my children are the prime example of how kids do this for themselves and on their own. And yes, there's some role modeling, but they have to be passionate about it, or that it doesn't continue. I mean, our son Josh is now very deeply involved in the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, leading a whole group of young professionals across New York City where he lives. Our daughter, Eliana, has gotten involved in creating a black teacher pipeline project to create more black teachers in America and, and is getting involved in BCRF, did the New York Marathon to support breast cancer research. I mean, there's no question. And you know, please. And, 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 our, and our new daughter-in-law, Catherine, is, is engaged with all of this. We are so blessed to have such great kids. And okay. I understand that you have a, a, you'll have someone else to, wait, this is just my only follow-up, but you'll understand. <laughs> uh, I understand that you're going to have a new member of your family to instill these values in, Laura. Wow, Katie. OK, so she's spilling the beans. Um, Yes, Catherine and Josh are expecting. Uh, <laughs> okay, so Mazel. They, Mazel, you two. <laughs> they asked me what I wanted to be called, and I basically said, Savta, Savta. Isn't that the sweetest name? I love that name. And Gary is Saba. You didn't have any say. <laughs> <laughs> That's very exciting, yeah. really thank exciting. You. Thank I'm you, jealous. thank you. <laughs> but I did want to ask you one last question about Jewish philanthropy. Apparently, at a Jewish Federations of North America event, you got involved in Jewish philanthropy. Yes, I am a Lion of Judah, everyone. Woo! <laughs> uh, I 
I'm so mad I forgot. I could barely remember to bring this watch. I'm very mad that I forgot my necklace slash brooch, but I'll wear it next time. I'm with you all. So yes, that was wonderful. I got to be at the national meeting in Phoenix not too long ago. So I'm on the Jewish circuit, <laughs> clearly. Rubber chicken dinners, I warn you. Yep. Katie, cancer has been a part of your family tragically in so many horrific ways. Um, your sister Emily, a Virginia State Senator, died at 54 in 2001 of pancreatic cancer. Your first husband, Jay, died of colon cancer at 42 in 1998, and you were diagnosed recently with breast cancer. And you have been very public about all of these. First of all, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for Yay. asking. I'm good. Um, you know, the reason I, you know, it's, it's sort of embarrassing to talk about because I was diagnosed at quite an early stage. I was stage 1A and had a lumpectomy and radiation. I'm on these aromatase inhibitors, which I hate. If anybody wants to discuss this, call me. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, you know, I think the reason I appreciate you even bringing up the breast cancer is I'm trying to use it and use my platform to educate people about the importance, not only of screening, but of getting additional testing if you're one of the 45 plus percent of women, 40 and over, who has dense breasts. Um, oftentimes mammograms cannot detect any kind of abnormality in dense breasts. As my breast radiologist described, it's like trying to find a snowball against a field of snow. So I just urge everyone and to tell the women in their lives that in addition to getting mammograms, they need to inquire about getting breast ultrasounds or MRIs, which I got consistently from my doctor. But a lot of women don't know, A, if they have dense breasts, which can only be indicated on a mammogram, and B, that there are additional testing that may in fact save their life. So we're, we've introduced legislation. Um, my husband makes fun of me. He goes, what are you, Nancy Pelosi now? <laughs> and I said, uh, and uh, with, with uh, Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut to get insurance companies to pay for breast ultrasounds in women with dense breasts. So hopefully that will happen. Katie, you're so public about this. And it's so helpful so, to so many of us. You even go on the air and do these things. I mean, you were on the air doing a colonoscopy. You were on the air doing a mammogram. How do you decide what to do about these things? I think when Jay died, honestly, I felt so bereft. You know, I was 41. Our girls were six and two when Jay died. And it was such a shock. Um, he was healthy. He played lacrosse and football in college. He never smoked a cigarette in his life. Um, and it was just this terrible turn of events. And I think I felt so powerless during the course of his illness, even though I tried to find clinical trials. And you know, I was calling cancer centers all over the country. And in fact, I remember calling one in Israel to talk about monoclonal antibodies and antiangiogenesis. And I had to learn all this, this new language of cancer. And when Jay died, I felt like it would be almost criminal for me not to tell people what they needed to do to prevent this number two cancer killer of men and women combined. And so, you know, I realized I had this platform, which at the time was the Today Show, and I said to our executive producer at the time, I really want to educate people about this disease. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do it and to destigmatize and demystify the procedure was to undergo a colonoscopy myself. So I did it, and I think the University of Michigan said it resulted in a 20% increase in colonoscopies, which translates to a lot of lives saved. So I, I felt like, <laughs> honestly, I appreciate it, but I think anyone in this room who had been in my position would have done the same thing, especially considering the values that we've heard about here already. I think it's just, I, it was sort of a moral obligation for me. And, uh, you know, it also made for a lot of great jokes. And, uh, you know, um, but I'm really, I'm really, and then I stayed with it. You know, I kept, I took Jimmy Kimmel to get a colonoscopy. <laughs> he was really funny. And, uh, 
you know, have tried to really make it top of mind. I recently teamed up with Cologuard, and while it may not be the gold standard that colonoscopies are, if you don't have 100% compliance, you have to do what people would be willing to do. And if people are willing to do a Cologuard test mm -hmm. and can be prescribed by their doctor, and of course, you know all about healthcare disparities. It's just unconscionable, the disparities in healthcare in the United States. So I've teamed up with them to try to emphasize that the best test is the one that gets done. And so hopefully a lot of people will, will, um, will go ahead and get get that kind of screening if they can't afford or have access to a colonoscopy or for whatever reason don't want to do it. And then you also created Stand Up to Cancer. Yeah, so that was in 2008. So I really started to feel that I was spending so much time focused on the colon. I felt like other body parts deserved my attention. <laughs> And so I, uh, with, a, with about eight other type A women, including people like Sherry Lansing and Laura Ziskin, who was a, quite a well-known Hollywood producer who did Spider-Man, who was dealing with breast cancer and tragically lost her, her fight with that disease, we decided to form Stand Up to Cancer because we thought cancer research was too siloed and that it was too, the research was too proprietary, and we thought if two heads were better than one, 10 heads are better than two, why not get all these brilliant scientists, and they are brilliant, they're the smartest people on the planet, to share their research, to share their tissue samples, to share their brain power, that we could move science faster, and, and further faster, and get people, more patients into clinical trials, et cetera. So since we started Stand Up, we've raised, I think, over $700 million. Bravo. And we have funded 29 different dream teams, which are scientists from different institutions or pharmaceutical companies, biotech firms, uh, you know, universities, who all work together to try to unlock the mystery of various cancers. Some are working on epigenetics and trying to figure out the role they play. We are doing a ton on immunotherapy, which was initially kind of mocked as a cancer treatment. And now, I think most of our money goes to immunotherapy, which I'm sure you all know is bolstering the immune system so it can kill the cancer instead of kind of the scorched body policy of chemotherapy and targeted therapy. So, um, I think our scientists have contributed to nine new FDA-approved drugs, and uh, you know I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this organization. And I always think of that Margaret Mead quote, which I always get wrong, but I'll attempt it anyway, which is never doubt the ability of a few committed citizens to change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And to walk into these Stand Up to Cancer fundraisers, which are held every two years, and we do a televised fundraiser, and just to see it, it is just so moving and so remarkable. But most importantly, to see the scientists really excited about collaborating instead of competing, mm -hmm. that has been incredibly gratifying. Well, collaboration is your middle name. I mean, this is what you do so well. And, and it's our message to the audience today, the Katie Couric approach, you know, leverage your network and your resources, no matter the number of zeros, to do jikun olam. I mean, that's, that's what you exemplify. And there's a, a, a Hebrew phrase, gimilut chasadim, which means acts of loving kindness. That just defines you, Katie, and it's just so impressive to watch you. You've done some incredible documentaries on guns and obesity and, and, and gender identity. Um, tell us about those efforts, how you pick those issues. And, 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 and guys, you have to watch these videos. They, we have to make sure that everybody sees and has the ability to watch these amazing videos. Well, for some reason, I like to, I try to tackle these seemingly intractable problems and connect the dots to hopefully come up with solutions. In, I guess it was 2014, I saw that I'd been covered, covering the obesity epidemic for years, and yet, nothing was changing. In fact, it was getting much worse. And it was really uh, creating problems for our national security and military readiness. I mean, all, so many different aspects of human life and, and, and American life and food deserts and, 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 again, sort of health disparities. So I just said, I'd like to tackle that. And that 
that was a, uh, it's a really good documentary <laughs> if you all want to watch it. It's about the role sugar plays in sort of within the low fat craze that I grew up with, snack wells, et cetera. When they took the fat out of so many foods, they put so much sugar in because it tasted like cardboard. So we did a story, uh, a documentary on that. Then gun violence is something I care deeply about reducing. And I mean, I just posted, I don't know if you all follow me on Instagram, the three young people who were killed at Michigan State. It was just so heartbreaking. And the fact that we can't seem to do more in this country to reduce gun violence and is just, to me, unconscionable. And so I followed some families from Sandy Hook, from the Aurora shooting, and from other incidents to, to really talk about and, and connect the dots about the proliferation of guns in this country. There are more guns than Starbucks and McDonald's, gun stores than Starbucks and McDonald's combined. Oh. And I think we live on the coast, and we don't realize sort of how, how there are more guns than people in this country. So I try to get people to care. I try to make them emotionally connect to these subjects. Mm -hmm. Gender revolution, my daughter went to Stanford. Yeah, I know. She's smart. <laughs> and, uh, and she came back and she said, you know, Mom, when we introduce ourselves in our classroom, we, introduce our, we give our names and our, our preferred pronouns. And I was like, wow, that is so interesting. Mm -hmm. Something is happening in this country about gender identity. Mm -hmm. And um, I had made a very stupid mistake when I did my a talk show about uh, interviewing a transgender woman. I asked a really sort of inappropriate question. I kept it in because I wanted it to be a teachable moment for the, our viewers. But I was really eviscerated by the trans community, and rightly so, I think. And so I wanted to to take that embarrassing moment and turn it into an opportunity for me to explore a topic and help people who were probably just as ignorant as I was mm -hmm. to better understand uh, what it means to be a, a transgender person in America. And I profiled a bunch of families. So I think I'm always trying to learn and trying to understand, and I hope through my efforts, it will help an audience understand an issue, have more empathy, compassion, and a, a stronger desire to solve problems instead of create them. You know, for those of us who care so deeply about these very issues, you enlighten us, and you make us better philanthropists. So thank you for all that work. Well, That's thanks. just, it's so important. <laughs> So you mentioned your girls, so we have to talk about family. Um, so Carrie and Ellie, they're so adorable. Uh, Ellie is now in LA, a writer on The Boys, a show on Amazon Prime, and Carrie is 27. She lives in Brooklyn and is a documentary filmmaker. We have to introduce them to our kids. They're yeah. going to be fast friends. I remember when Ellie was 31, or she's 31 now, but when she got married in July of 2020, mm -hmm. 2021, well, you wore this gorgeous Georgina Chapman dress that just, <laughs> oh my god. You have to go on her Instagram to look at it. Just, just being able to post on Instagram, to me, is a, a real skill. <laughs> my daughter, Eliana, kind of hijacks my phone every once in a while. And she has created an Instagram account for me. And so she kind of takes pictures. And I bet that this little situation is getting posted right now. So. <laughs> I admire you for knowing how to use Instagram. Well, you know, I, I actually, social media, I have very mixed feelings, as probably everyone in the room does. Social media can be uh, just a terrible thing, as we know. If you've seen recent studies about young teenage girls and sort of rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, suicidal ideation, it's really terrifying. And uh, Jonathan Haidt, who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind, is working on a book about that right now that comes out in February. And I've been talking to him about doing a companion documentary to that. Um, awesome. but, but I also think when used properly, it can really build community. It can help educate people. You, it, I love the interactivity of it, the fact that I can go directly to an audience. I can hear what they have to say about what happened at Michigan State or other pressing issues, environmental issues, things that everyone in this room cares about, global warming, things like that. And so I've tried to marshal the power of social media and use it 
for good. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I enjoy it, and I'm glad you like my dress. <laughs> I kind of designed that dress, you know. Did you really? I did. Oh. I went, of course, typical me. I, my daughter's getting married, and it's like six weeks before the wedding. I'm like, I better find a dress. So I called Georgina, and I said, can I just come and look at some of your things in the showroom? Maybe I can borrow something. I'm very frugal, by the way. <laughs> so, um, so she brought me down there, and I tried on a dress, and I said, can we make this in pink, and can we put some flower appliques on it? And right. it's, it, you know, it was like party in the front and, and business in the back. And it's Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty. That's so gorgeous. you can borrow it. <laughs> Somebody I know just borrowed my dress that I wore to the Kennedy Center Honor. She liked it, and her daughter was getting married. Oh so I God. said, do you want to wear my dress? And then she called me and said, my tailor is here. And I was like, what? <laughs> But it was fine. I was happy. I was happy to give it another life. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> it was a mitzvah. Oh. <laughs> You're getting the lingo here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so back to the girls. So you actually sent Carrie to a Jewish camp, Camp Fernwood in Maine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this it's is hard to be Carrie Monahan or Ellie Monahan at a Jewish camp. So they well, had not mitzvahs. <laughs> they did. So here, here's the, the, the beautiful story that I want everyone to hear. Um, so Carrie did this. The, 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 the camp had this program that they would skip dessert. And the money that would have been spent on dessert, the kids got to allocate. And so it was Ellie. Oh, was it Ellie? Yeah. Okay. So, so, and then Ellie apparently made a speech to the whole community and talked about colon cancer, and she advocated for the National Colorectal Cancer Research Alliance in memory of her dad. How cool is that? It was wonderful, especially given the fact that Ellie, you know, kids don't want to feel different, you know, especially at a young age, and I think for Ellie, uh, she didn't want anyone to know she didn't have a father at camp. Mm. And she would write letters home to, you know, Mr. and Mrs. J. Monahan, mm -hmm. and um, you know it was painful for her. So for her to be able to, I think she was ten, yeah. to stand up and and talk about her dad and talk about the, the philanthropy we were doing to try to find better treatments and diagnostic tools and and screening for mm -hmm. colorectal cancer was a was a big moment for her and the camp director wrote me a, a beautiful note saying how there wasn't a dry eye in the camp and I was incredibly proud of her. Those moments of being a parent and just being so proud. So let's talk about grief. You've had your share. Um, after losing Jay, the love of your life, how did you find love again with John? I asked a lot of friends to set me up. <laughs> I had a lot of really not great relationships in the interim. You can read all about them in my book. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I just was so, so lucky. I'm so lucky. I have a great husband. By the way, I have a 37-year-old niece in San Francisco. <laughs> now listen, everyone. She is a producer for CNBC. She's really pretty. She's really nice. <laughs> she's really fun. And I already told Laura, and honestly, she's kind of come up empty-handed. <laughs> she has more important things to worry about, apparently. So if anybody knows a nice Jewish boy, I would say between the ages of 35 and 45. <laughs> OK? Her name is Laura. Laura Bachelor, and she's my sister Kiki's daughter. And my sister Kiki really wants her to have a boyfriend, too. Thank you. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. No, really, call Laura if you know anybody nice, because she's fabulous. OK, sorry. Moving right along. <laughs> so Katie. OK, good. OK. OK. Oh, good. We've got some, oh. we've got some people. <laughs> So Katie, this is actually the Jewish Stanford Business Schools Group Association right here. Hello. So highly qualified. <laughs> Perfect. Smart. And Jewish. But that you're usually that when I when people found out I was Jewish, this some old lady came up to me, she said, I knew you were Jewish. You're so smart. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's so uh. funny. All right, we have to get on to, to Katie's incredible career. So Don't these people have places to go? No. <laughs> okay. I feel bad. Sorry. Well, I think it's really important for, for, for you to tell a story about failure because you are absolutely the most successful mm -hmm. woman journalist that I am so proud to know. But your very first moment out there on the White House lawn, you botched it. You were reporting on the president's schedule. And apparently, the president of the network said he never wanted to see you on air again. <laughs> that was so. a real confidence boost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was terrible when I started out. And I think this is a good thing to tell all the young people in the room is, you know, Malcolm Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to become good at anything. And, uh, you know, I, I wasn't, I think, I was never sort of plucked out of a crowd at, by a news executive who saw something special in me, wanted to mentor me. Um, I didn't look sort of like a typical anchor, which at, back then was more like a junior miss kind of contestant. It, mm. it had a certain look. And um, I was sort of more of the scrappy street reporter. But yeah, I, I was terrible. I, was, I had practiced all night with my brush like Marsha Brady in the mirror. Like, today the president is meeting with National Security Advisor Savignu Brzezinski. And I was awful. And um, he did say that, but I just kept at it. And I think the more you do something, the better you get at it. It's as simple as that. And if you have the will, you can make a way to achieve. And you know, you're so sweet to say I'm successful, and I think I am in many ways, but I've had a lot of setbacks. I wasn't really embraced at CBS News. Uh, I was the first female solo anchor, and it was very difficult externally, where there was a lot of sexism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people said I lacked gravitas, which I said now know is Latin for testicles. <laughs> and they, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, so that was really, really hard because I had had this incredibly successful career at NBC. And I also, my other one, I always say I got into television in the late 70s when harass was two words instead of one. <laughs> but, um, but that usually, t easy. <laughs> it usually takes a minute. But, um, but anyway, but you know, I had, I had a setback at CBS, which was really a public embarrassment and really difficult. And I talk in the book about uh, crying at the kitchen table with my girls who were about, I think, 10 and 14 at the time, maybe, maybe a little older. And I was crying because I was getting attacked in the media and people inside CBS weren't being very uh, supportive, to say the least. And I was like, I know, you know, doing the whole Mary Tyler Moore thing. And, <laughs> and my daughter, my younger daughter, Carrie, said, Mom, Remember what Samantha says. And I'm thinking, oh, mother of God, she's quoting Sex and the City. <laughs> she goes, if I listened to what every bitch in New York said about me, I'd never leave the house. And I was like, this is so disturbing on so many levels <laughs> that, that you're quoting Samantha. But anyway, it was really funny. But I, I, I had some setbacks. And I, you know, I, sometimes I still kick myself and think, why did I go to CBS? I was at a place that really liked me and supported me, but I, I felt it was important for the public to see a woman do a job that she hadn't done before on her own with confidence and competence. And I hope I move the ball a little forward to people who came after me, like mm -hmm. Nora O'Donnell and other female anchors. Where there's, they're everywhere now. But back then, it was, really, it was really challenging and really hard. And I think that I've just accepted that I grew from the experience mm -hmm. and that it's made me the person I am today. But you know, you're not always going to be successful. And I think part of life, for me anyway, is taking chances and taking risks mm -hmm. and, and trying new things and growing professionally and personally. So um, and I, I think, I'm glad I, think, I did it. I think one of the things that you found very compelling was mentors. I have my rabbi and mentor right here, Phyllis Cook. And you wrote this magnificent piece about Barbara Walters in the New York Times. If you haven't read it, you have to Google 
Katie Couric's um, uh, 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 memory of Barbara Walters and, and what you said about Barbara and what it meant to you to have a mentor. And now you are a mentor to so many other young journalists. I would love for you to just say in our last few minutes here a few words about Katie Couric Media so, you, so we all can oh, now sure. follow you a lot more. Yeah, but just a quickly about Barbara Walters. You know, she, I mean, she went through hell. Honestly, and she had to fight for everything she had. Mm -hmm. And I so admired her tenacity and determination and her refusal to take no for an answer. And she used to always say, you remind me of me. Neither of us is very glamorous. And I'd be like, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but um, she, she was amazing. Um, and, and you know, so I think for me, What's exciting now is I've become an entrepreneur. And in a city full of entrepreneurs, the media landscape has changed dramatically. You know, I still don't feel necessarily super comfortable going, you know, giving my opinion on a lot of issues. I, I, I'm pretty outspoken about gun violence, and I try to foster empathy and understanding. But the direction of TV news, where people are so opinionated and kind of tell you, I think, what to think instead of how to think about things. I've never felt super comfortable in. So we started a company about four years ago called Katie Kirk Media. I didn't want to name it that. My husband made me. And so he's- Jewish he's, husbands do get their way sometimes. <laughs> he's, he has a finance background, and he's, he's incredibly smart. And so we now have over 40 employees. I'm a job creator, yeah. And uh, we're, we're trying to build a thoroughly modern media company. We have a daily newsletter. I hope you all will sign up for it. You go to katiecouric.com. It's called Wake Up Call. I'm doing a podcast. We work with purpose-driven brands, brands that care about not just the bottom line, but how to make the world a better place. So they care about sustainability. They care about giving back. They care about a whole host of of social issues, um, you know, gender equality, racial justice, all the things that you all care about, I'm sure. And so we do storytelling surrounding that. And it's been really an exciting venture. And I'm also continuing to work on documentaries and some scripted shows as well. I was involved in a show called Unbelievable, which was on Netflix about uh, a young woman who was raped. and the way the police handled the case. And uh, so I, I feel it's very liberating to be able to do a whole host of storytelling in different ways and to reach people where they are. Because I think there's, just, there's so many opportunities to talk about important things in different ways where people will consume it mm -hmm. and hopefully understand important issues better. Katie, I was so intimidated when they asked me to interview you. Did you did such a good job, Laura. No, no. <laughs> Didn't she? But I, I, I don't know. I see filling in for Hoda in your future. <laughs> <laughs> but the justice that you pursued, tzaddik, tzaddik, terdof, which is the Hebrew phrase for justice, justice shall you pursue, that is what you do every day. And we are so grateful to you for creating Katie Couric Media and for leading us in all of these beautiful ways. Katie, Aww. we thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. We did a great job. Put up high. I'll watch. <laughs>